Remember the days when music and politics went hand in hand? These days, all we ever hear linking the two is when a musician threatens to sue a candidate for using his or her song at a campaign rally. So much for rocking the vote. Join me to talk about this and more as tonight's musical caucus. First, Larry Watson. Freedom. He's a Berkeley College professor where he teaches ensembles, performed in more places with more groups than I can count. He's one of the hosts of the great GBH show, Oh, Sing That Thing. Good to see you, Larry. Danielle Moralia. She's a blues artist and Emerson College grad who's been nominated as Singer Songwriter of the Year by Boston Music Awards. Congratulations, good to see you. And my guy, Tom Rush. Now you see me come and throw your men out. Rolling Stone magazine has credited Tom with ushering in the era of the singer-songwriter, and here they are, live and in person. Good to see all see three of you. you. So in that little clip in the background, I was actually there, I don't know if it was that night, Club 47's in the background, it's now Club Passim. You, Dylan, Joan Baez, mm -hmm. Joni Mitchell. Are there places like that for young Tom Rushes to be playing today in this kind of part of the world? I would say the Club Passim, although it's not genetically related to the Club 47, Club 47 closed, the place was right. vacant for a year. Bob and Ray Ann Donlin came in, opened Passim, uh, but they're doing the same kind of music. If I was that age now, I'd be, you know, going to the open but aren't mics. There many more, weren't there many more places when you were a kid oh, there were than dozens. there are now? There were dozens, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, you, I saw, I heard you're, per you're performing on a train, which I think proves my point. <laughs> Weren't you on some train doing something? Yeah, some? we did the thing that opened up the corridor in Dorchester to the new stop. So I do those kind of events to have these young artists because there are not very many places they can perform. So I take those kind of gigs and take my students with me and do But that. what do you say to a kid, like she was a few years ago, who's got her talent and she says, where am I going to play? Where am I going to do what I do really well and want to do? I think you have to be very creative but I think with some of the new social media stuff, students are bound by doing their own videos and stuff. And I think I try to impress upon these young people, take the opportunities when they come. But it's very difficult because there are not many, very many places around for certain genres of music. Do you have a hard time finding places? No. I mean, you're really good. No, you don't? I mean, we have, we have a, I think we have a thriving scene in Boston right now. Um, we have, we've, when I first started What, you out, mean really talented people or um, a lot of places of for really above. talented places all of people the above. play? I mean, people claim when they come into town from out of town, it's hard to get gigs here. I think it, it can be a little bit insular sometimes, but, but I mean, when I was starting out, I mean, I, there was an open mic you could play every night of the week. So you could, you could be a new artist and be playing. You could get that, that live time every night of the week if you want. And you can still get that. Time for a little positivity. You, you know, know I, think, I think the point you made that on social media, you, I checked right before the show, 6.8 million <laughs> hits wow. on the internet. What's the name of that song? The Remember Song. The Remember Song. 6.8 million hits. So in, in, to a great degree, that's taken the place of live performances. It's, about, it's a song yeah. about a guy who can't remember anything. It is, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> my, my wife claims that the 6.8 million hits are all one guy. He can't remember he's already seen it. But, I think it, it but depends that's the on deal, genre, right? though, because I think for R&B singers... Uh, it, it, the places are scarce and very difficult uh, oftentimes, uh, and so they have to be very creative. R&B uh, singers uh, are having a challenging time, because of not unless you're singing about the things on the ways down. Because of the logistics of having the band There's just not that many places. If I even look at, not that you want to travel 500 miles out of town, in Dorchester and Roxbury where there used to be incredible uh. nightclubs and R&B clubs, and so they've all been torn down. And gentrification has meant that now if you do want to perform, you've got to go out to a place that's not very near home. Well, you know, it's not, it's not only uh, not a place very near home, despite what Danielle says, and you obviously would know, it's sort of like it's easier to sit on your couch and watch you perform on YouTube. Well, so yeah. make the case There's for exactly right. sitting in front of your body, listening to any of the three of you sing. What is it about live music for somebody watching who hasn't been to a club in ages? Well, you get... You get out of the house. <laughs> oh, that's one important thing, yes. You get, there's a community, there's a sense of community to it that, that you're not going to get sitting in front of your laptop watching yeah. a, you know, watching you, an you online get hecklers. concert. It's, you get it's hecklers. Live. <laughs> it's live. I understand it's, 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 it's live, Tom. So, but the, what? The, no, but, but what I mean is I, I used to play these places where I do like two-week gig, same place for two weeks, same town, same demographic. Every night, the crowd is totally different. Yes, that's right. And so it's an interactive thing between the stage and the audience, and it's, 
And you're uh, better. Are you not better? Aren't all of you better when there's a live audience? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. an exchange of energy. The, the studio you know? is a totally <laughs> different experience. Absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and live performers, that's a unique entity. It's different from the recording. I'm not great in the recording studio because it's... Just too much rigidity. But you're great on a train, I hear. Well, on a that? train, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to talk politics for a couple of minutes. I, I led this. You know, REM tells whoever uh, they told uh, uh, Trump, don't use my song. The Dropkicks, the local great band, tells Scott Walker. Of course, it's a little late now. Scott Walker, I mean, it all started with Springsteen and Reagan not understanding what Born in the USA <laughs> was about. But I read on the Berkeley site, I find music to, this is from you, in case you forget. Okay. I find music to be one of the most effective vehicles to promote social justice in the world. Are you in a time warp? What am well, I missing? Well, I said that a long time oh, ago. Oh, you did say that? <laughs> but I still do believe that. I'm committed to that in my life. But now it is such a sad time, it's very disillusioning. Because uh, music has now been used in the very opposite way it was used. When I, I met Barry Gordon, I said, you saved my life. And he cried. Founder of because Motown it was three people Barry who don't Gordy and three people don't because I could have done drugs in Best Style I could have been in the gang but Motown had me to exchange music I learned my I, my craft came about the way that's not the case so I still believe that I have to believe that you grew up in the era and with people the names all the names we know when music mm -hmm. was politics what happened <laughs> you know I can't answer that and it's one of the questions today is where are the protest singers there's mm -hmm. so much going mm -hmm. on why don't you ask her. Where are the um, protest singers? Where are the protest singers? <laughs> they're not being put out. I mean, that's not what's popular now. So that's the problem. I Would mean, you think about doing um, a song about politics? Oh, I, I have plenty of songs about, about politics. Like what? Um, I mean, I, I think you have to do it in a way that's not preachy, and that's that's the hard part. You have I don't to tell. Mind well, <laughs> no, I mean, I think people will shut down if you're if you're telling them what to do. But or if you can, get, if you tell them a story, I feel like you need to tell them a story. That makes them think what you want them to think, <laughs> rather well, you know, than telling them what. what so to you're think, talking about a little bit of know? indirection, Danielle. Yeah. Well, you know there are a lot of rappers. There, I mean, Kanye West, obviously, and a lot of people. I mean, you get past the misogyny from here, here and there. But there's a lot of politics. That's the one well, yeah. genre where it's still happening. But no? the difference, not really. What the difference is when you offer a black kid from the inner city a million dollars to say his mother is a bee then in many instances that's what they're going to do. We've got to bring that back. We've got to give students a platform. But what happened is music moved from people like you and Barry Gordy and musicians to MBAs. And so now I just did some research that shows that four white males basically have controlled 80% of this new music industry where people are being misogynistic and racist and deplorable. And young students I work with today who want to do that, and I'm encouraging them to do that, they're still looking at, well, Professor Watson, Larry, where, where are we going to do it? I think you have to be committed to it because it's connected to your very future and the very lives of your community. You ever been in the same sentence as Barry Gordy before this or no? Mm -hmm. No. I didn't first. think so. I had a first. feeling it was. And so, I'm honored. So when I came to see you a couple of months, you had a great young kid. What's the name of the kid who was playing with you? Matt Nakoa. Fabulous, by the yeah. way. Yeah. So he, what do you he'll say? He'll be with me at the Cabot. Great. Well, we're going to talk about that in a second. What, what do you say to the young kids, to his students? Uh, what do you say uh, who have talent, who are ready to go, who are a little depressed because there are not as many venues, despite what Danielle says a minute ago? What, do you, what advice do you give that kid? Matt Nicoa, by the way, was at Berkeley. Was he really? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I, I, tell, I tell kids to play in front of a live audience every chance they get Absolutely. because that's really where you learn. Open yeah. mic, whatever Experience. works. Whatever. Open, yeah. open mic, street singing in the park, whatever. You know, and a live audience will tell you more in five minutes than you can learn you know, sitting in your garage for five months. Absolutely. So what do you yeah. say to that Emerson kid who followed you, who admires your work and says, I want to be her? What do you say to them? Um, I, exactly what, what Tom just said. <laughs> just There's nothing like live performing to get the, it's not, nothing like experience. How about you? You can tell them to stand key. for something or you'll settle for anything. Yeah. Go and there do it. Go. Don't forget to church. Don't forget other yeah. places where there's an audience. Create your own audiences and listen to people like us. And when I ask you to do a gig, do it and let the money be secondary because the money will come. That's great. Three really talented people. Larry Watson, good, good to, to see you. Again. Danielle Moralia Thank and you. Tom Rush. Now, if you want more from these people, Tom has a show at the Cabot, as he said, in Beverly. That's tomorrow night, correct? Tomorrow night. He does. You're at the Larkham? Mm -hmm. Sound Larkham in <laughs> Beverly as well, popular town. You can find more about all these people on our website, greaterboston.org. Great to see all good to three see of you. you.